continuing in our series this morning on this idea of growing and maturing in the Lord uh, with a message that I think applies to uh, virtually every person in the world and the idea of idols and what are idols, especially looking at what idols are from a biblical perspective and then looking at our culture and asking ourselves, wow, is that, is that part of my life? Our God does not want idols. He does not want something standing between us and him. He wants a clear path between us and him. In fact, he absolutely craves it and desires it. He wants nothing in between. That's how intimate he wants to be with us. So we start in Hebrews as we've been starting for this whole time, the sneakings of idols, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves. And today is really part of training themselves, training us to distinguish good from evil. Can you turn this down just a smidge? Thank you very much. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teaching about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Is it possible for you today, as an American, that... There could be an idol in your life. If you, just con- if you just consider culture, is it possible that there would be an idol in your life? I'm not here today to say to you or pronounce to you that you have an idol. Somebody say amen. What I'm here today is to help you understand that it could be possible and then allow the Lord to help you to discern whether it's real or not whether you do function with an idol in your life. I think the, the truth, if we were really honest with ourselves, most of us would say that it's possible. Just because of the life that we live, the culture that we're in, the things that are going on around us, it's possible that there could be something functioning between me and my God that is causing a problem between me and my God. So how does God view idols? How does God look at idols? So turn with me to the book of Exodus all the way to the beginning of your Bible. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6 this morning. This is really uh, where we begin to see God speaking. This is where God gave the Israelites their Ten Commandments. And he, the first and second commandment helps us to understand how God views idols. Starting in verse 3 of chapter 20, God himself is speaking. He said, you shall have no other gods before me, first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. For everybody who's related or relational to God, the first commandment is that you shall have no other god before me. There should never be anything in between you and him. Secondly, he says, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to the thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, most of the time when people read this scripture, they, they immediately jump to, uh, for, the, for the Lord your God is a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the Father. And immediately they begin to go to, well, that's not grace. That's not how grace works. Jesus canceled all that out. Jesus did it. None of this applies to me. Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law, not cancel the law. So he is the fulfillment of the law, not canceling the law in fact jesus becomes the second part of this but showing love to a thousand generations those who love me and keep my commandments so is it fair for us to say this morning to make an assumption or to come to a conclusion that god has a strong opinion about idols In fact, he has a very strong opinion about idols. Such a strong opinion that he's saying 
that even if a father has an idol, he's going to punish the generations to three and four generations later. I would say that's a strong opinion. How many of you want to have your children punished for your idol? Or your grandchildren punished for your idol? Or your great-grandchildren punished for your idol? I know I don't want to do that. I don't want to pass that to my, child, my kids, my generations after me. So is it fair for us to assume and take from Scripture, this is directly out of the Word of God, that God has a strong opinion about idols? I think it's fair to assume that. I think it's something we should be looking at, especially if we are saying that we are growing and maturing in the Lord, and we want to grow and mature in the Lord. Should we look at this particular part of what that means for us? You know, one of the things that happens for us who are preachers or exhorters or evangelists or whatever, I mean, my, my giftings are preaching, teaching, evangelism. That's my, those are my giftings, exhortation. Those are the things that God has gifted me in, called me to use for His kingdom is that when you are preparing a message like this, you can't prepare this message without somehow finding conviction in your own life. I think sometimes, oftentimes, people who are sitting where you're sitting think that people who are standing where I'm standing are somehow just saying these things to somehow make you feel guilty. Or somehow to get you to change. But I say to you, any man of God who stands in this pulpit or stands in a pulpit first has to deal with it himself before he's going to be able to help you deal with it. And if he will not do that, then he's not truly where he should be. So this idea that God has a strong opinion about idols is important not just for you, but for, for me. It's for the whole church. It's for Jesus' church to begin to understand that that jesus has a strong opinion about idols again last week we talked about who who wrote the bible from the very beginning it says let god god said let us make man in our own image so is it fair for us to assume that jesus helped to write the bible yet he became the fulfillment of the bible his life lived and fulfilled the bible but he did not cancel the Bible. He fulfilled it. So if God has a strong opinion about idols, then I think Jesus has a strong opinion about idols. And how does that affect me today as a modern day Christian living in the 21st century? What does that mean to me? How does that play out for me? Do I have idols? Do I have things standing between me and, and my Jesus? Do I have things that are affecting that relationship that I'm worshiping, that I'm glorifying instead of Him? I, I admit to you this morning that this is a very mature concept, isn't it? This is, a, this is something that, wow, do, do, I, do I really have idols? I think idols are so sneaky that we don't even know that we're doing it. I think our enemy is so sneaky that it's just there. And we're not even aware how it's affecting us. We're not even aware that we're worshiping it, that we're glorifying it, or it's. And we're investing in it. Our life is being invested into it. The life that He gave us, 
for him is being invested in something else. It's being poured into something else. And I think that's why God has a strong opinion about idols. Now last week I preached stewardship and, and you know, I, I pray that it was a blessing to you. I understand it's a challenging subject and this is not necessarily about stewardship. This sermon is not necessarily about stewardship but it's about understanding that there are things that we're investing into in this life that may not be really God. They may look that way. They may sound that way. From a worldly perspective, they may fit into that. But are they really? Or are they something else? What is the definition of an idol? And these are, these are things that I wrote down that I felt like was in my heart from the Lord. The first one is something that either myself or someone in my family has created or taken from this world that exists in the emotional, mental, physical, or spiritual realms of our lives. Something that we have created. We can get an idea of what this image of creation looks like when, when we go back to you know, the Exodus and, and Moses goes up on the mountain and, and he's there for 40 days and the people say, where is Moses? We're going to die here. And they, they convince Aaron to do what? Replace God. Even though God, they had just seen God bring all of these things to Egypt so that Egypt would let them go. Even though they'd seen God provide for them all the way to the mountain, now they want something else. That looks like God, it sounds like God, we can make it my God. But it was something that was fashioned, something that was created by man that looked like something from this world. Sounded like this world. Presented itself like this world. That there was some sort of an emotional, mental, physical, or spiritual connection to in this world, but not necessarily in his kingdom. Secondly, something that myself or my family are worshiping or giving homage to other than God. God says he is a jealous God. How do, how do we compute jealousy? Well, the easiest way is to say, if my spouse is cheating, am I jealous? See, the intimacy of a married relationship is what? Intimate. It's meant just for the, those two people, right? Right? It's not meant for someone else to be involved in, right? And so when my spouse is cheating, then am I jealous? Or if my spouse is cheating, am I jealous? Well, that's how God feels. Because that relationship between me and him is supposed to be me and him. Not me and him and somebody else. Not something else in there. It's me and him. And this idea of him being jealous for me. When I'm allowing other things between to enter that circle, to enter that relationship, to enter that connection, when I'm allowing something else to be involved in there, God is jealous for me. He is so jealous for me that he sent his son to die for me so that I could be in that relationship with him. Without that, I couldn't even be in that relationship with him. But he sent Jesus to die for me so I could be that intimate with him. So that the temple curtain was torn so that the holy of holy was open so I could be in a relationship with God. And then I bring someone else to the relationship or something else into the relationship. And my God is a jealous God. 
when I begin to worship and give homage to something else, my God is a jealous God. He's not happy with that. He's not content with that. No more than any of us would be if our spouses did that. It shows you the intimacy of what he feels when we're bringing something else to the relationship besides him. Something that stands as a hindrance between myself or my family and my God. Something that is tainting my relationship. It's almost like I'm, I, I'm looking for God through the trees, but I can't see God because of all the trees. I can't really be in relationship with Him because of all the stuff that's in between me and Him. These are simple ideas that maybe help us to understand, is, do I have those things in my life? Maybe another way to help you understand, when you sit down to pray, is it just you and God, or is it you and God and 500 other things? When you sit down to read the Bible, is it just you and God, or you and God and a whole bunch of other things? Because I can tell you, folks, one of the things I hear more than anything else... When I read the Bible, I'm just not sure I, I understand it. That's not God. God wants you to understand the Bible. Somebody say amen. He wants to bring the Holy Spirit so you understand the Bible. Is the problem with God or with me? When I'm praying, God wants to meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. He wants to share with me one-on-one. -on -one. He wants to hear my heart and then he wants to speak to me. He wants to tell me what to do. He's my good, good father. He loves me. He wants to put input into my life. And if he's speaking through me through the forest, I can't hear. It's bouncing off everything else before it gets to me, and I'm only getting a piece of it. I'm only getting a part of it. I'm not getting everything he wants to give to me. Because there's things in between. Jesus speaks to all those things that are in between that potentially could be idols in Matthew chapter 6 on the Sermon on the Mount. Is there idols in between? This sermon really kind of started brewing in me when we were in Israel. In fact, one of the first things I sent back from on Facebook was a picture out of our hotel in the Mount Zion Hotel. We were, we were staying in a hotel right on the top of Mount Zion. That alone kind of makes you feel a little weird because Mount Zion is all throughout the Bible. Somebody say amen. But we're sitting in this hotel room and we're looking out our eastern window and you can look straight out our eastern window and there's a, there's a mountain top right there. And there's a valley below you, and you can't see the Temple Mount because it's, too, it's too, the, too the north of you because it's behind another mountain, but it's, it's over here. But from this other mountain over here, you can clearly see the Temple Mount. You can clearly see where the temple was, clearly. Well, that mountain, that's where Solomon let all of his wives build their altars of worship. That's where they built an altar to Molech. And they built an altar to Baal. Within clear view of the Temple Mount. That's where they put the Asherah poles. That the Israelites would go to the Temple Mount to worship, and then they'd go to the other mountain and worship their other gods. Somebody say amen. Do you think God was jealous about that? Solomon allowed other influences, other things to come into his life, fully knowing that he was worshiping the one true God, and yet he let these other things be built. These other idols were built. The interesting thing about that is that as you come down the slope of that, that mountain, 
there's a valley underneath of it that leads up to another valley. The other valley is called Gehenna. G-E-H-I-N-N-A. Ga means the valley. Henna means hell. The valley of hell. Right from the base of that slope where they had all the, all the altars, all the idols, all the things, there was the valley of hell. And in the valley of hell, you know what they did? That's where they sacrificed their children to Molech. And before you kind of start shaking your head, I want you to think about something. We have an altar called freedom of choice in this country. It says a woman can sacrifice their baby to that altar by the thousands. So don't shake your head too strongly and say, well, that's not us. We wouldn't do that. In that same valley, that's where they would bring the, the, the parts left over from the animal sacrifices to the temple by the cartload, and they would burn them there. This valley was perpetually a perpetual fire. That's why they called it the Valley of Hell, because it was a perpetual fire of burning parts of animals. It never stopped burning. Amazing contradiction, isn't it? The sacrifices of humans at the temple being brought to the same valley of the sacrifices of the idols all being to be burned. It's a picture, isn't it, for us? Right in, right, in, right in view of the very temple where God was seated, they were doing these things. And they did it for hundreds of years. Those idols, those altars stayed in place all the way. Go to your kings, first and second kings, all the way through multiple kings. It says this king was a good king, but he didn't tear down the piles. I mean, it was over all the way till King Josiah came. And he got the book of the law. And when he read the book of the law, there was conviction that came upon his life and he realized that the nation, that the nation of God was living according to idols. They were worshiping idols and he destroyed them. I think the world around us needs a few Josiahs. Instead of Hezekiahs. Or Jehu's. Idols are prominent in our lives. We live in a nation that serves multiple idols. And I don't even have to start naming them for you. Because you already know what they are. Right in full view of the very kingdom of God. Right in full view of the very church of Jesus Christ. We live in these idols. We allow these idols to be evident. Now I understand that no one person here in this room can change an entire culture. I understand that. Somebody say amen. But I think every one of us has the power to change ourselves. To examine ourselves. To ask ourselves, do I have an idol or idols in my life that is affecting my relationship with God? That is affecting my family? We agreed earlier that Jesus and God himself takes a strong view about idols. For us to really begin to understand, we have to become spiritually alert. Say that with me. Spiritually alert. Say this with me. I want to be spiritually alert. To become spiritually alert means that I become aware 
of what's going on around me. Sadly, many of us as believers are not spiritually alert to the things that are going on around us. We're just kind of living life. How do we become a spiritual alert? 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, Peter's writing, he says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Do you know that the enemy is trying to devour you in your life? Especially if you're carrying the cross of Jesus Christ. Or you're proclaiming Christianity. You're proclaiming Christ. The enemy is trying to devour you. He's trying to devour your family. He's trying to destroy you. Would he bring an idol in your life that would be part of that? He is so sneaky. And if I'm not alert to what's going on around me, I'm just doing it and I'm not even aware. Peter challenges us to be alert to the spiritual things. Not just the physical things, the spiritual things. How do I train myself to be alert through the Word of God? Romans 1, 22 and 24. I'm going to be, actually begin in verse 18 because I want to read this whole section, but I didn't have enough room on my slide for the whole thing. Somebody say amen. Romans 1, starting in verse 18. Paul is writing to the church at Rome. He says, starting in verse 18, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Here's where verse 22 comes in. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images that made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts. Anytime you see a but or a therefore in your Bible... You need to pay attention. Could it be possible that God has given me over? I'm not saying it is. I'm saying could it be possible? Because I have an idol in my life? He's given me over to that idol. He's just saying, okay, go ahead, worship that idol. Go ahead. I'll just let you have that. Go for it. I'll just let you live there. That's fine. I'll give you what you want. Therefore, that's what that means. He basically just gave them over. He said, okay. That's what's in your heart. That's what you want to do. That's how you want to live. There you are. Have it. And then we become dissatisfied with our faith. We become dissatisfied with our God. We say things like, God's not answering my prayers. I don't understand scripture. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to live. I don't know where God wants me to be. I don't know how this plays out for me. I don't know what Jesus is asking me to be or do. 
And is it because I'm not hearing clearly? Because something is standing between me and Him? And I'm just, because I'm just so used to it, because this is just the way we are, this is just how we function, this is just the way life is. This is the way the world is around me. You know, all that's how it is. We've just accepted that. We're just allowing that to happen in our lives. I confess to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that I think any one of us potentially could have an idol in our life. At least one. And that idol is functioning between me and my God. And it's a problem. Because my God is a jealous God who desires all of me, not just some of me. He's a jealous God who wants every part of me. But He's only getting some of me. And eventually He just allows me to live there. He allows me to live there because I become okay with that. I'm okay with just some of God. I don't need all of God. I'm satisfied with just a little bit. Instead of all of him. I, I confess to you, fellows, brothers and sisters, that when we come to a conclusion that there's a, something there, it's hard work to get rid of it. Especially if we've been living there for a long time. Because people around us won't understand. Why I don't do that anymore. Why I'm not involved with that anymore. Why I'm not taking part in that anymore. Why I don't let my kids do that anymore. Why I don't let my kids be involved there or my kids be involved. They won't understand. But we will understand because at that moment when we make those choices, my relationship with God becomes so intimate. And we will live in intimacy not in clouds of unknown. Not in all these perceptions of what is or what isn't. God will be so clear for us. So all of that said, how would we, def how would we know if I have an idols or idols in my life, active in my life? And I'm not going to say this statement that I'm going to share with you is the only way to know. This is just what the Lord put on my heart. Somebody say amen. So if this offends you today, I ask you to please forgive me because I'm not trying to offend you today. At all. But how can, what is one way that we can know? I think this is one way. When the resources I have been given by God, time, money, spiritual gifts, talents, abilities, expertise, etc., that were meant to bring worship and glory to God and His kingdom are being used to bring worship and glory to something else. When I'm at the base of the mountain and I'm supposed to be waiting on God and I'm worshiping, glorifying God, I'm creating a golden calf. Because it's easier for me. Idols are so sneaky, folks. They're so sneaky. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, we live in the realm that is controlled by someone and all the things of this world he wants to bring into our life, they are meant, absolutely meant to distract us from the one true God. They are meant to take our time. They are meant to take our money. They are meant to take our spiritual gifts and we're going to apply them to these things over here instead of God and his kingdom. That's what they're meant to do. They're meant to somehow get me out of this intimate relationship with my Father. 
that Jesus died to give me. And it distracts me. It distracts me. And my focus is changed. How do we combat that? Again, discernment and discretion. The two D's that we're just continuing to understand. How do we distinguish these things? Discernment and discretion. By asking myself the hard question. Is this really from God? Is this really where God wants me to be? Is this really where God wants me to put my resources? Is this really where he wants me to spend my time? Or am I just doing it? Am I just involved because I enjoy it? It's fun for me. Which one is it? From August till January this, this, in this country, every Sunday, every Sunday, there are stadiums full of hundreds of thousands of people to worship an idol. In St. Louis, we have a huge idol. It's called the St. Louis Cardinals. And it's all about leisure, entertainment, me, because I deserve it. That's how sneaky it is, isn't it? I confess to you, I love a good football game. Somebody say amen. Baseball bores me to death. I love a good football game. I love a good basketball game. But is it my idol? I can tell you for many years of my life, sports was an idol for me. I don't necessarily think it is now, but I know it was. In fact, it was the idol that required of me everything. You can know that there's an idol in your life if it's requiring of you something. It's requiring you to give it or to sacrifice it or worship it or pay homage to it because that's what it wants. It wants to steal the glory and the worship of God and take it away from God and give it to itself. That's how you know it's an idol. When it's taking what you should be giving to God and you're giving it to it. That's an idol. That's the very essence of it. So it takes discernment for me to look at that thing and say, wait a minute, is that really what I'm supposed to be doing? Is that really where I'm supposed to be today? Is that really how I'm supposed to be spending this time and this money and these resources? Is that really what God would want me to be doing with this? That comes down to your own discernment. I can't tell you what the answer to that question is. I can ask you to discern about it. To check it out. To be certain that that's what God's asking you to do. Not what the world's asking you to do. What is God speaking to you? That's called discernment. How do I get discernment? Through the reading of the word and through personal conversation. If I, take, if I know already that those two things are cloudy for me, I would ask you today to start here with idols. 
because there's idols in your life that are clouding that for you and God's trying to speak to you through this and through that personal conversation and the trees are in the way and he can't get to you because of the stuff that's in the way. And you're only getting a piece of it. You're not getting the whole thing. You're not getting all that he wants to give you because your idols are standing right between you and him. This book is so clear. His voice is so clear. But it's like me doing this. What do you guys want to do now? I'm trying to help you. Oh, you can't help me. You can't help me. Can you hear me? I'm trying to talk to you. Can you hear me? Hey! Hey! Listen to me! Anybody want to say amen? He's screaming. Trying to get your attention. And you can't hear him. Because you got too many things in your way. And then you're frustrated. Well, God doesn't answer my prayers. Or God doesn't give me revelation when I read the Bible. Or God's not telling me what I need to do. He's trying. He's trying. He's absolutely trying. You can't hear. Because it's like he's talking into his own hand. Because you got all these things between you and him. And you're frustrated. And I got a news for you. He's frustrated. He's frustrated too. Because he wants to help you. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to live the way he wants you to live. He's absolutely frustrated because he can't talk through the stuff. The only person who can remove an idol is you. God will give you over to your idol just like he did the church at Rome. He will give you over to your idol. He will let you live right there if you choose it. You have the opportunity to choose something different. What will it be? As the worship team comes, I draw your attention to 2 Timothy 2, 21 to 25. Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, Those who cleanse themselves for the latter will be instruments of special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Somebody say amen. That's a picture of what New Testament believers should be. Right there. We as a church, we've been presenting these things to you. These wills, the will of the Father, that the loss of this will be brought into a right and true relationship with the Father. To the death, the resurrection, and ascension of his son, Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ. That's what we should be about. That the Father's church would seek to save the lost through the biblical presentation of the cross of Jesus Christ, leading to true repentance, forgiveness, healing, and physical and spiritual conversions. The other night we had a youth event here. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. 
We had a youth event. We had three young people give their life to the Lord. Amen. Folks, I want you to know something. And this is from the bottom of my heart. I want you to hear me. This world will lead us astray. And if we as a church are going to focus on this world and the way the church, the world thinks we're supposed to do things, we will never meet up to Jesus. We will never fulfill our purpose as a church. You will never fulfill your purpose as an individual if you're going to do it the way the world wants you to do it. It's not going to happen. There's a wide road, and then there's a narrow road. The narrow road looks like this, that the Father's converts would grow and mature in Him through the personal and practical application of His Holy Word, learning how to discern good from evil, live holy and righteous life, and seek and save the lost. That's the narrow road, folks. Distinguishing good from evil. That's the narrow road. It's not an easy road. That's why many of us don't want to get on this road. Because this is not an easy road. It's a challenging road. It's hard. It takes sacrifice. It takes commitment. It takes a willingness to give up things for Him. It takes a willingness to look at my life and ask myself the hard kind of questions. To look at that. And be aware that God loves me. He wants that intimate relationship with me. But He will not ever, and I want you to hear me, He will never force Himself on you. He will only come when you open the door for Him. He is standing at the door knocking. You have to open the door. He's not going to come barging through the door. You have to open it. You have to say yes to Him. You have to begin to listen to His voice. Listen to His life. Listen to what He's saying. He's not going to come battering down your door. So every one of us in this room have a choice. We have a choice to be intimate with my Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Or we have a choice to choose what we want. We decide. We decide. He gives us that choice. Every one of us has that choice. I confess to you that after preparing for this sermon, I again had to get on my face right there at that cross and give up my idols. That's what I had to do. And I was even surprised by what some of those idols were. Somebody say amen. I was actually kind of shocked. Because they seemed like really good things from this world's perspective. But it turns out, they weren't. They were idols. Today is Stewardship Sunday. So we're going to ask some of the elders, Rodney, come up, hand out cards since he's the only one out here. Everybody else is committed. If you haven't received a stewardship card, just raise your hand. Rodney's going to give you a card. If you already have your card, that's awesome. That's great. We're just going to invite you to bring your card to the front this morning during ministry. I'm going to pray. We're going to invite you to bring that. If you don't get it up here today, you can drop it in the box in the hallway whenever you want to drop it. We're grateful. We want you to know, as, a, as the elder team of this church, we are grateful for your financial commitment to this church. Because without your financial commitment to this church, we cannot do the things that we're doing. So we know that, and we're grateful for that. Whatever that is, we're thankful for your commitment to the church. We pray that the Lord will bless you as you commit to stewardship with your resources, your time, your money, your life. 
for the furthering of his kingdom. As you do that today, and again, this message was not meant as a stewardship message, but I invite you to ask yourself, are there idols in my life that are in between me and what God wants me to be doing? Am I committing my resources to something other than what I'm supposed to be? That's between you and the Lord. I invite you to discern this morning from the Lord through His Holy Spirit what it is that He's saying to you. I promise you, He's not trying to keep it a secret from you. He wants you to know. So I invite you to stand with me this morning. We're going to pray. I ask you to raise your hands to the Lord. And we're just going to pray this morning for His His awesome plan here for our lives. Lord, we thank you today for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that today you, even though we may have an idol or idols in our lives, you still love us and you care about us and you want us to break through. You want us to be free from those things. I pray, Jesus, in your mighty name that you would minister deeply into our hearts here today, that you would touch us with your power and your presence, that you would show us where those idols may be. And Lord, give us the courage. Give us the courage to give them up, to let them go, to trust you, to trust you, Jesus, to let them go and to gain that intimate relationship with you that we so desperately, Lord, need and you so desperately, Lord, want to have. We ask for that. I pray that you would minister into each life here today according to your spirit and according to your will and according to your way. It's in your mighty name, Jesus, that we pray these things. And everyone said, Amen.